rare C-level role, how to find executive jobs. Welcome on. Go ahead and say hi in the chat. Say where you're coming from. And today we're going to talk about how to make sure that we are landing these executive and C-level jobs. We're going to answer questions about, you know, what is the job search strategy you need to have these jobs? Because they are a lot more difficult to find. There are fewer and far, farther between and the requirements for them and the expectations for them are significantly higher than potentially other jobs you've landed in your career. And we really want to make sure that we are identifying what are the right opportunities, finding those and sealing the deal. Now, I am very excited. I am not doing this alone today. Um, I'd like to introduce Danielle Ceballos, who is the president of the Advanced Innovation Society, um, Conviction Marketing Agency, and Kelly Roach International. We have both hired executives, been executives, and so we are going to dive into these questions. Welcome, Danielle. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to dive in. We've got a lot planned. Yes. And so we do need to treat an executive C-level job search a bit differently than other roles. Um, why do you think, like, what are some of the ways that you feel that an executive job search is a bit more, should be treated differently? Yeah, I mean, from a hiring perspective, the executive roles you hire for are literally the people who run the company. And so you're much more cautious in who you hire. And you're usually, usually uh, much more specific about what you're looking for. And so you have a lot of clarity, I feel like, with an executive hire that you maybe don't have as much for, or maybe don't care at the level of, of a lower level hire. Because when you're hiring for more production type roles, there's some gray areas where you're like, okay, like someone who's good at this, they could be good at the job. So there's a lot of flexibility. Whereas when you're hiring for an executive, you usually have something very specific in mind and you're unwilling to settle. So it's a, it's a totally different process. I think the unwilling to settle is something that I've definitely seen really emphasized of the impact that an executive has on a business is so large and to make the wrong hire there is so scary for employers, yeah. which means that these little things, these yeah. little things in the job interview process, if you say this slightly wrong, or if you kind of give them a slight other impression Companies don't want to risk it and say, okay, that was a red flag. We have to move on. Um, I thought it'd be kind of fun to mm -hmm. talk about some of those, those yeah. more nuanced red flags. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, which ones come to mind for you? Yeah. And I will say that some of this comes from some experience in the past. So um, of good hires and bad hires. Um, so a, a couple of things that are red flags that you might not even realize. And and I, I actually hope this is probably true across the board, but certainly for an executive, if you speak in any way negatively about your past employer, it's like an immediate no for me. Um, one of the things that I've learned in hiring, especially high level leadership, is that integrity and honesty and the ability to really um, take ownership are literally like quintessential absolutes, like things I won't, you can even have some skill areas where there needs to like some development, but without those things, it's like a hard no. And to me, that's a sign of no matter what happened, I don't know what happened. Um, that's a sign of not being able to say, Hey, here was my part in this. And I learned something, I pulled value out of it and I moved forward because for me hiring at an executive level, I want to know that even in the crappiest situation, you took something out of it and you actually were able to learn or grow or, or change or do something with some bad apples. And if you can't do that and you're kind of talking negatively, it's like an immediate note for me. Yeah. And What's so true about that is also your your locus of control when you're an executive is even is much more is is much more bigger than than lower level roles. And so if you're speaking poorly about the employer, always the question is, well, what did you do about it? You know, what, what did you do to change it? How did you how how are you proactive in that situation? So it, it kind of has this this almost like you're taking a back seat to some of the issues versus being much more positive, much more proactive. And I, I, I'm thinking back to so many of the 
uh, interview feedback forms I heard about executives. And one thing that came up all the time, which is, you know, seemingly minor, but would lose people the job all the time was rambling in the job interview where it seemed like this person, they were afraid to put this person in front of a team because the communication wasn't crisp and concise and direct. And so little nuances like that, I think a lot of us in job interviews, we might be a little bit more rambly or, or long-winded than we would actually be in the job. Yeah. But unfortunately that is losing us the role. Yeah. And I would say that as an executive leader in any size company, big or small, you are responsible for communicating the vision, values, and expectations of your organization. And if you can't clearly and concisely do that in an interview, when it comes to an interviewer asking, how did you actually get results? How would you make changes here? If you can't concisely articulate the value you would provide and the impact you would make, then what faith would I have in you to stand in front of a team and be able to do that? Now, it doesn't mean you can't, but if you couldn't do it in an interview, how do I know you're going to be able to motivate the team? How do I know you're going to be able to manage the projects the team is responsible for? And how do I know you're going to be able to clearly articulate what the company values and is it about if you can't do it in an interview? Right. It, yeah, it's this, it's, this, it's this mini sample of your communication style. I've even We've even uh, rejected once a candidate for his his communication between interviews, if you can believe that. It was just, it really showed that he was like, wow, this is what it would be like to work with him is, is this kind of disjointed approach to communication. So even that aspect of between interviews, you wouldn't think that that would win or lose you the job, but even that can make a huge difference. Yeah, if you seem high maintenance between the job or you yes. seem... Uh, not resourceful. Like we provided you everything and then you go and look for all these other, like you can't find them and you are responding back and forth. Like the admin assistants and the executive assistants, they tell all of that stuff. So you really need to be mindful of every piece of communication. Absolutely. I think about uh, one of my clients, Wilson, he, he came to me and he was, I looked at his resume and, and everything about him. I met him and, and saw his personality and thought, okay, how was this guy not landing more job offers? He was getting, kept getting to later round interviews and getting other people getting the executive roles. And it was so interesting because it wasn't these big grand things that he was doing wrong. No, it was little nuances. He would say low value phrases in the interview that, as you were saying before, kind of just devalued him a little bit or the stories he chose to tell in the interview were just not the ones that hit on exactly what he was bringing to the table and what they needed to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, And he also just had this unnatural approach to interviews where he was showing up differently to interviews than on the coaching calls where he would talk more normally. And so it was so interesting um, Mm -hmm. to see that in my coaching program. And I will put, I'll put in the chat and in the description more information Mm -hmm. about the coaching program, but I just think, I think we always need to kind of focus on, okay, what are these nuances? Because executives land roles Mm -hmm. based on their qualifications, but it's the nuance that puts them over the edge. Yes. I mean, certainly when you're like, think about it, there are just a few executive positions in every company, even big companies. When you look at the percentage of positions in the company, the executive positions are the most coveted and they're the fewest. And so you have to assume there are lots of people who want that job. So the thing that's going to help you stand out is going to be that small little thing that you might not even realize. Um, So really making sure that you um, pay attention to those little things that to you might seem so silly, but they mean a lot. And remember somebody is trusting you with this massive role in their company. When you're at even the vice president level or higher, when you're there, like you have people under you, you have budgets, you're, you're managing the money. Like there's so many components of that, that it's an important decision for an employer. Absolutely. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Tara. Thanks so much for contributing um, to the channel and giving a super sticker and shout out to you in Aldina, California. I'm in California as well. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so I do want to dive into, okay, so where do we make sure that we find these roles? How do we identify where these, cause you, you mentioned there's very few of these roles in businesses. Mm-hmm. 
I'm curious to hear how you've typically hired executives. Where do you find them? <laughs> well, um, to be honest, these aren't roles that are always published. They're not always roles that are out there. So I know you talk about this a lot. I know people don't love it, but networking is so critical. Building a personal brand is so critical. Um, a couple of ways that we found them. Um, I was actually someone who started as a contractor and then was promoted like five times up in, into my role. Um, so sometimes being willing to take a lower role in a company that you really, really want to be able to kind of climb through the ladder, climb, climb through the ladder, climb up the ladder is really important. Um, but the way that we've hired in the past, there's really two ways. It's a personal referral, uh, someone that our company, someone in our company that we trust knows a, a a person in their personal life or from a past work uh, experience, or we've used uh, recruiters. And so when we are looking for different companies, um, we work with a handful of companies that have a network of people, and then they provide us with the people that we think are best. And again, many of these positions never get posted. They are simply like, we get the, we gather the referrals and the, the, um, you know, recommendations from the headhunter, and then that's all. There's a handful we posted. There's probably one or two in the last year that did get posted, but most are not. I want to shout this from the rooftops because what you're saying is not unusual. Mm -hmm. So many of these jobs are in what is called the hidden job market. Put mm -hmm. yes in the chat if you've heard of the hidden job market. Put no if you haven't. I'm very curious to hear if that if that's a common this common knowledge. But um, there's a lot of different estimates of how many jobs never hit job boards. It's anywhere between 60 to 80% of jobs. And I think that percentage is even higher for executive roles. Yeah. And yeah. so that's why, it, exactly as you're saying, taking these alternate routes mm -hmm. to get into the pipeline is super important. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start maybe with, with the networking aspect, because that's what you mm -hmm. brought up first. So... Um, I think what you'll probably hear from a lot of people is, but Danielle, I don't, I don't know the people in the companies I want to work at right now, mm -hmm. or, or I'm switching industries. So I don't know them. What, what would you say to that or for people who are, who are wondering, how do I even get known how to get referred into these things? Yeah, I think there's a couple of layers. And sometimes people don't like my answers because they feel like work. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to apologize now. Um, I don't have any shortcuts or magical ones. Um, but what I will say is, number one, you have to be really clear about where you do want to go because you want to make sure that you're building connections and relationships with the right people. So having some clarity on the direction in which you want to move is really important. That's step one. Step two, there might be times where you need to pay to get in the right rooms, right? You need to pay to get in a networking community. Um, maybe you need to join a professional group where, you know, like I was in marketing. So like, joining professional marketing groups where there are people from, you know, CMOs from companies that I might not be part of, um, attending events and being willing to step outside of your comfort zone and make introductions and go to the cocktail hour and have some conversations. Like I'm an extrovert, so I love that, but I know not everybody is. Um, but if you want to build connections, you have to be willing to do that. Um, and then my favorite that I talk about all the time, building a personal brand online. You can actually kind of undercover, connect with a lot of people. And sometimes, you know, we think, oh, well, to get that position, I need to connect with the CEO in that company. Most of the time, they're not the first, they're never the first person that you're going to. So connecting with the right executive assistant or the right uh, VP, if you want to be a president or another VP, like connecting with someone at a slightly lower level, but who still has influence and can make the introduction is so important. So building your personal brand online gets you on the radar of some of those people. And again, that's who, where headhunters will often start. That's where recruiters will start. So just understanding that it's sort of this ecosystem you need to build of stepping out and meeting people in person, going to professional events and networking getting in networking situations, whether you've got to pay to get in the room or not, and then building your online brand. When you do all of that, you end up opening doors of opportunity that you would have never dreamed about because you're on people's radars. And when the time comes and you're ready to make the move, you say, oh, wait, I actually do know so-and-so there. Maybe I can see if there's anything open. What I love about that is you're 
you're having this proactive approach where it doesn't feel like you're bugging people or irritating people, even though reaching out to people is totally fine. And you can absolutely do that to ask about opportunities, but the personal branding, the going to network groups, you're building these relationships as it goes. So when you do come to the group and say, Hey, I actually think I'm going to make a career move. Do you, do you know anyone who knows anything about C-level roles for, for marketing in the e-commerce space? Boom. Everyone says, Oh, I know Danielle. Of course. Yeah. Danielle, let me introduce you to this person. Let me introduce you to that person. Um, I, I'm, I really got to know you through these coaching programs that I've Mm -hmm. been a part of that have been amazing. And it's been so fun to build these relationships and, and that has been amazing. And now I'm a part of the advanced, um, and, uh, you know, the, the advanced innovation network. And that has been really cool of, yes, it's, it's specifically a group focused on Mm -hmm. networking. It's all executives. It's all business owners. It's people who are saying, Hey, I want to meet each other. And what I love about it is people come into, when you join a networking group, everyone Mm -hmm. there is eager to meet you. So even if you are maybe a little more introverted, it it kind of, it softens all that where you don't have to really go up to anyone. Everyone's there saying, please talk to me. Let's talk. Like, let's, I want to hear about your, your work and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if you want to kind of explain, because you, you really, you really led this program and and what, what kind of makes it so um, powerful? Yeah, I think when we looked at sort of the landscape of networking in general, and again, I'm an extrovert, so I know if I feel this way, I can't even imagine how the introverts of the world feel. But when you go to traditional networking events, they just feel really transactional and sort of slimy, right? You're like, stand up, you give your little pitch, and then like you move on. And is there value in that? Of course, there's some value in it. But what we found is that our greatest, um, our greatest connections, our greatest business growth opportunities have always come from just being in the right place and adding value and people saying like, oh, Danielle really knows her stuff. Let me connect you there versus me saying, I'm Danielle and I run a marketing agency and I'm so great. It's totally different when somebody's sat and listened to me teach multiple times or when we've been at dinner and I'm like, oh, here's how you fix that problem. And I just walk them through a new way to market, right? It's an entirely different experience when Um, they know that I can provide value. Now they're much more willing to say, oh, you should check out Danielle. So when we started the Advanced uh, Innovation Society, it was specifically designed to facilitate those conversations and not just become a pitch fest. So we have online opportunities to do that. And then we have offline opportunities, in-person events and online opportunities where we actually build out community, like circles where you're actually having conversations based on different topics and you get to showcase your value versus just tell people you're great, which I think is really important because there's nothing more powerful than having someone watch you over time provide value because when something comes up that makes sense for you, they will very readily think of you. And when you go and ask them for something, it doesn't feel weird because you've spent time pouring into that bucket. And they're like, of course, like you provided me so much value. I would love to make the introduction. So having that long-term perspective is so important. And that's what the advance is about. That's so great. That's exactly it is, is let's make this easy for ourselves. Let's make it a bit more proactive. Um, I'm curious to hear in the chat, we'll do another yes or no how many of you are a part of some sort of formalized networking group? And, and maybe networking might be too specific of a word. I mean, it could be something that is, is more of a meetup, right? That's, that's happening regularly for in your profession. Um, and I would say regularly would be probably be at least, you know, once a month, you're, you're keeping up on this, right? Or maybe you're part of a certain uh, uh, group where you, you know, uh, get together or anything like that. So, okay, I'm seeing some, um, um, oh yeah. And then um, Simply Motivation asks, as a business owner, I'm wondering if I can join that group. Yes. Yeah, so this group is for corporate executives and business owners. If you go to the advancedsociety.com slash membership, um, that is open to entrepreneurs and executives. And the reason we did that is because executives know things about business that entrepreneurs don't. And entrepreneurs know things about branding and personal branding that executives don't. And y'all, we need each other. We need each other. So it's a, it's a great little community. 
Yeah. And I put, I put the link in the, the chat and in the description, um, simply motivation, if you want to, if you want to check it out as well. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. So it seems to kind of split right now. We see different people who, yes, you know, you're part of these groups. Um, but then we also have plenty of people who are saying, no, this isn't really something that I'm focused on right now, which is actually pretty normal, especially coming out of the pandemic, right? We might not be as uh, thoughtful about, okay, we're going to be a part of um, these groups. But now, I mean, now they're, they're really, these, these communities are, are either, they're now coming back in person, or a lot of them are really ramping up again. Um, and Joel, yeah, I, I mean, church is, at least you're mixing and mingling. Like, it's amazing how maybe bring up some things about your career a little bit more often of like, when people ask you how you're doing, maybe you'll talk about, well, you know, I've been actually kind of looking for my next new challenge. I, I'm really interested in X types of roles and just throw it out there. And it's amazing. The person in the pew next to you might have a cousin who works at the company that you want to work at. Yeah, I literally did this in the church lobby la like a couple of weeks ago. A friend of mine, she had worked in a, in a company and she wanted something that was different. She wanted something that was virtual. And I literally that day connected her with three people because she just mentioned it in the in the church lobby when we were outside. So it's totally, totally, totally doable. And it's a great place to connect with people. And again, that's a situation where you are building relationships. Now, I don't love like turning your church into a business, a place of business, but there are people with jobs there and there are people in, in different industries and you are absolutely um, in a setting where you can have meaningful conversation and build trust where people feel good about referring you for things. So I think it's a great place. Exactly. There's people when, wherever there's people, you have no yes. idea who those people know and who they connect you to. That's why treat everyone with respect and kindness because, and because you should just be a good person, but also because, you know, you, you, you can't really judge a book by its cover of, of who, who really has those connections that are going to get you to the next level. Um, so, okay. The to do, uh, before we move on to the, the next, the second part of this, the to do for, for you who are watching is get networking, right? Figure out something today where you're going to join a Slack group, a, a networking group, a, um, you know, an, an industry specific uh, conference or, 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 you know, any sort of thing that, that will help you to make sure you're communicating with people more naturally and authentically throughout your day that are besides your coworkers, um, which, you know, obviously your coworkers necessarily won't refer you to your next role because that's very sensitive. But what I did find, just a side note, is when I left one of my jobs, uh, I, you know, when, when I finally left a job where I was the head of HR, I noticed that those people then started referring me to other companies. So mm -hmm. I like when, when those employees left that company that I still worked at where I met them, they wouldn't refer me to companies because they didn't want to poach me from the company that they had worked at. But as soon as I left, mm -hmm. those people were referring me back and forth everywhere. They're like, Oh, she's on the market now. She's, or she's now, you know, separated from that company. So we feel okay with it. So also be in contact with your previous coworkers and all that kind of stuff, because they, they truly know what you bring to the table. Now mm -hmm. I do want to talk about, the other side of it. We talked a good bit about referrals, building relationships. Let's talk about being sourced and working with recruiters. So when you, well, first of all, Danielle, why, why would you hire a recruiter or an executive recruiter to hire someone at the C-level or executive level um, when you could just maybe open open online applications, why not do that? Why 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 keep it so secretive or, or off job boards? Well, because when you open up online applications, you get twelve billion people applying, and many of them are not qualified, and so you end up either wasting a lot of time sorting through or just talking to people that are not going to be a good fit. And so, uh, the reason we would hire. Um, any kind of recruiter or headhunter is because we want to make sure that if we're going to go through the interview process, that we're doing it with the best 
quality candidates and we don't want to go through, you know, 12,000 people to get there. I mean, I can tell you, I, I, I posted, you know, all kinds of jobs from interns all the way up and it is shocking to me and I kind of love it. I'm like, okay, I love you going for a job that you have no experience and background in, <laughs> which again, and depending on the role, I might consider you, you know, if I feel like that's a feisty move, but for an executive, like, you have to have the goods and you have to have the, those nuanced things we talked about earlier. And it's just not, it's so tedious to sit through and sort through all that, especially knowing so many people will apply who really shouldn't have probably applied. So I hate to be like really honest, but uh, that is part of why we use it. Yeah. I, I've said this before, Danielle, I think online applications are one of the worst things to ever happen to job seekers. Because mm -hmm. while you're saying you're, you're sorting through these things, that's the worst, the, who that's damaging the most is job seekers competing against other job seekers to be seen. Mm -hmm. And there's amazing people on this session right now who their application, you probably wanted to read, but it's buried by hundreds and hundreds of applications that seemingly have nothing to do with the job you put out there. Like you're just, how you obviously just hit some button and put, put this information out here of like, you didn't read the job description. No. And that is actually something that will immediately get you like a no from me because it's such a waste of time and it's so frustrating. And I put, I write very specific job descriptions and I'm very clear about the steps I want you to take. And it's a test in following directions and whether or not people will do it. And if you don't, I don't care how amazing you are. I'm not going to talk to you. And so, yeah, it's a matter of convenience really and making sure that you're talking to the right people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so you work with these headhunters. Mm -hmm. And so when, do you have any thoughts around if folks want to be found by a headhunter, I guess what would be your tips if you have any? Um, well, you should probably work with Madeline yeah. <laughs> and in an order. Um, I know a lot of them look that way, but also too, they have connections. They are yeah. reaching into their Rolodexes and they are looking for, oh, I, I just met this person, uh, you know, six months ago and he's kind of on my radar. He was happy to his company, but he's perfect for this. Let me call him. And so there's kind of two phases of that. Sure, they're going to be sourcing on LinkedIn and looking at your profile and all those things, but they're also building a database and you want to get on their radar. You want to be optimized so they find you and they start paying attention and that, that you're on their radar for when the perfect position comes up because that's really what they're doing. They're digging back into those Rolodexes, those virtual Rolodexes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I would say um, this is something that I'm, very passionate about is taking someone who has not really been getting that many recruiter outreaches and getting their online presence, getting their LinkedIn, getting, getting them on the map so that when these executive recruiters are looking to find these people, boom, you're showing up. And I've just seen tremendous transformations for people. Um, when you optimize these things properly, how you should never have to fill out a job application again. And maybe that sounds dramatic, but it's not dramatic. Oh, I, love that. It, I love it. It's, it's what I see my clients do every day is they stop filling out job applications and they love start it. attracting these opportunities from their network, from these executive recruiters who find them, um, mm -hmm. all those things. And so I think what I'm, I'm picking up from what you're saying is, is even if an executive recruiter comes to you with not the best opportunity, take the call. Be yep. in yep. the Rolodex because if it's yep. not this opportunity, it might be another one down the road, right? Yeah, and it's just a great opportunity to build a relationship with that recruiter because they're constantly getting positions. And so, like yeah. Madeline said, if it's not the right one, just to say, hey, thanks so much for thinking of me. And you can add something like, hey, you know, this isn't the right one, but if you're if you've ever come across something like XYZ, I would totally be interested. And now you're on his radar or her radar for something specific. And they're like, oh, okay, they're Daniel wants that kind of role. Okay, cool. And so again, they just file it away until they need it because they look awesome when they present the client with these amazing candidates. And so their whole goal is to get the right person in front of the right people, the right leadership. And so make friends with as many as you can. 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh man. So we are about the top of the half hour. Danielle, where can we find you? Where can we connect with you? Well, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I have forsaken Facebook and Instagram because <laughs> they're just making me crazy. So uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Danielle Savalios. It's C-E-V-A-L-L-O-S. And you can connect with me in the advance if you want to join us there. Perfect. Yes. And I'll link, I'll link your LinkedIn profile and the advance and all that stuff. I'll link that in the description. And thanks so much um, for joining us, Simply Motivation, Morris, Bez, um, Bill, Joni, uh, Mar Ma Ma Macus, uh, Angela. So good to have you here. And I'm going to send you away, Danielle, with a Wi-Fi high five. My 